Hello, I'm Andrew Hyatt, and I'm going to talk to you about large language models and how they relate to Emacs. And uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about the technology and how they, how we're going to use it in Emacs. There'll be demos and there'll be talks about, uh, I'll finish up by kind of talking about where I think this should go in the future. So to start off with, Let's just talk like what I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Like, what are large language models? Not not everyone may be caught up on this. Um, large language models are uh, a a way. Basically, the the current versions of large language models are all based on the similar architecture called the transformer. It's just an efficient way to train and produce output. So these things basically these um, these things are basically models that predict the next you know word or something like that, and they. Uh, they're trained on an enormous corpus of information. And they get extremely good at predicting the next word. Uh, and from that basic ability, you can train uh, through further tuning from hum human input, uh, human ratings, and things like that. You can train um, d different models based on that that will do question answering. And this is how basically ChatGPT works. Um, there's a base LLM like GPT. Uh, and then you have a chat version of that, which is just trained to just like you give it a prompt, like what do you want it to do? And it gives you an output that uh, does what you told it to do, or at least attempts to do it. Um, and so the power of large language models is they're extremely, extremely impressive. Um, certainly this is in AI, this has been the biggest thing to happen probably in my lifetime, or at least my lifetime as a uh, my working lifetime. So uh, let me give you a, a demonstration of just like what kinds of stuff it could do in Emacs. So here I have a um, Emacs file. So this is my Emacs init file. I have a change. Let's commit that change. And, you know, I don't like writing commit messages, so I can generate it. And it didn't actually just looking. So all it does is it's looking, it's just reading the diff. I'm just feeding it the diff with some instructions. And it like, is this a incredible commit message? It's not bad, actually. It, you can see that it actually has really extracted the meaning of what I'm doing and has written a reasonably good commit message. Now I have to edit it because this is not quite correct but it's kind of impressive how good it is. And my editing, it's its kind of easier for me to edit this than just to write a new one. And I, quite often, it's good enough to just submit as is. So this is kind of, uh, you know, you could say like, okay, this is just commit messages. You could respond to emails. You could, um, you know, using, you know, using your own custom instructions about like what you wanted to your email to say. And like, you don't, then you have to, you know, it'll write the email for you. It could do like this Emacs is a way to interact with buffers this could basically just output text. So uh, it's super useful for kind of like uh, understanding something and outputting text based on that, which is just useful for Emacs. So um, the drawback is, yeah, it's good, but it's not that reliable. And you'd think it's very easy to get caught up in like, oh my gosh, it, like this is so powerful. I get, I bet it could work this whatever idea could work. And these ideas, they, they almost can. Like, for example, I was thinking, you know what I could do? I don't like writing regexes. Why can't I have a regex displace, replace this powered by LLMs? And that way I could give just an instruction to uh, regex replace. And um, so for example, I could do Emacs LLM regex replace. This is not checked in anywhere. These are just my own kind of private functions. Um, my description, lowercase all the org headings. Let's see if it works. It might work. No, it doesn't work. So if I, uh, I'm not going to bother to show you what it actually came up with, but it's something, if you looked at it, you'd be like, wow, it's, this is very close to being like, it looks like it should work, but it doesn't. <laughs> okay. It's not quite good enough to get it right. And it's possible that perhaps by giving it a few examples of, or explaining more what, like what makes Emacs regex is different, it could do a better job and maybe it could solve these problems, but it's always a little bit random. You're never quite sure what you're going to get. Um, so this is the drawback. Like there's a lot of things that look like you could do it, 
but when it actually comes down to trying it, it's surprisingly hard. And uh, you know, and whatever you're doing, it's surprisingly hard to get something that is repeatably that's con uh, that is always good. So, um, yeah, th like that's currently the the problem. So, I want to talk about embeddings. They're another thing that LMs offer and that are extremely useful. They are um, what they do is they encode from a input text that could be uh, you know a word, a sentence, a small document. It encodes a uh, a vector about what the the meaning, the semantic meaning of that is. Uh, that means you could something that is uses completely different words, but is basically talking about the same thing, perhaps in a different language, should be pretty close. Uh, as a vector to the other vector, you know, like as long as they're similarly semantic things, um, like, you know, like the words like highway and camino uh, are, are, uh, are two different words. They mean the same thing. They should have very similar embeddings, right? So it is a way to kind of encode this and then you could use this for search. For example, I haven't tried to do this yet, but you could probably just make an embedding for every paragraph in the Emacs manual and the Elis manual. And then, and then there's a very standard technique. You just like, you find that you have a query, like, oh, how do I uh, do whatever, whatever in Emacs again? And you could, it, you just find the like 20 things that are closest to whatever you're trying to the embedding of your query. You send those things to the LM as, you know, with the original query and like, no, and you're basically like telling the asking the LM, look, the user is trying to do this. Here's what I found in the Emacs manual that's and the Elis manual that's close to what they're trying to do. Um, so can you kind of like just tell the user what to do? And and from this, and, and you could say like just use things from this uh, you know, that I give you. Don't just don't just like make up your own idea, you know, don't use your own ideas, because sometimes it likes to do that and those things are wrong. So you could try to you know do this, and you get uh, you could get quite good results using this. So no one, no one has done this yet, but like that should not be hard to do. Uh, image generation is something that's you know it's not quite an LLM in the sense of uh, these are it's a different technology, uh, but these things are kind of packaged together in a sense, and and you'll see that when I talk about Emacs packages, a lot of them bundle image generation and large language models. Um, you know, the, the APIs are often bundled together by providers. And the general idea is it's kind of similar, because it's very similar to large, uh, you know, doing a chat thing where you, you know, the chat is like you give it a, a text request, like write me a sonnet about, you know, the battle between Emacs and VI, and it could, it could do it. It could do a very good job of that. But um, you could also say, you know, draw me a picture of Emacs and VI uh, as boxers, uh, as a character character boxing in a ring, like a, you know, political cartoon style. And it can do that as well. And so, like, you could basically think of this as just sort of like, it's kind of the same thing with, as you, the you know, what you're doing with large language models, but instead of outputting a text, you're outputting a picture. Uh, there's also, I want to mention the concept of fine tuning. Fine tuning is a way to take your uh, take a corpus of inputs and outputs, and just from a large language model, you're like, okay, given this base large language model, I want to make sure that when I give you input, you give me something like output, and this is what I'm just going to train you further on these um, these mappings between input and output. And for example, you could do this. Like, let's say you wanted to fix that regex demo I had to make it good. Uh, I don't think it, I, I think it'd be relatively effective to train, to have regex uh, descriptions and regex examples, Emacs regex examples as inputs and outputs. You could get, um, you know, maybe a hundred, a few hundreds of these things. You could train it. Um, I think that is a reasonable way to, let's just say, I don't know if that, how well it would work, but these things definitely work some of the time and produce pretty good results. Uh, and, and you could do this on your own machine. Um, 
corporations like OpenAI offer APIs with to, to you know to build your fine tunes on top of OpenAI. And I think I'm not 100% sure, but I think then you can share your model with other people. But if not, then you just, you know, you could use your model for your own specialized purposes. Um, but in the world of like models that you can run, for example, based on Llama, which is like Llama is this uh, model you can run on your own machine from uh, Meta. It um, There's many fine-tuned models that you could download and you could run on your own, like, you know, there are, they can do very different things too. Like some output Python programs, for example, that you could just run. So you just say like, you know, I, I, you know, tell me how old, you know, let's just say you have a random task, like, you know, tell me how old um, these five cities are in minutes, <laughs> like based on historical evidence. I don't know, it's kind of a weird query, but like it probably can figure, it could probably run that for you. Like it'll encode its knowledge into what the Python program, then use the Python program to do the correct calculations. Um, and so pretty, pretty useful stuff. So I also want to mention um, open source um, and basically free software here. The, these LLMs are mostly not free software. They're sometimes open source, um, but they're generally not free without restrictions to use. Most of these things, um, even like Llama, which you can use on your own machine, have restrictions that you cannot use it to like train your own model. This, this is something that, you know, it costs millions and millions of dollars to to uh, to train and, and produce these models. And that's just computation costs. Like uh, they, they do not want you kind of like stealing all that work by training your own models based on their output. Um, but there are research um, LLMs that do, I believe, conform to free software principles. They're just not as good yet. And uh, I think that might change in the future. So speaking of the future, uh, one of the things I'd like to point out is that like the demos I showed you are based on, I'm using OpenAI 3.5 model. That's like more than, the, uh, well, no, it's like a year old basically at this point. And things are moving fast. They came out with four. Four is significantly better. I don't have access to it. Um, because even though I'm using the AI, uh, the API and I'm paying money for it, you only can get access to 4.0 if you can spend a dollar. And I've never been able to spend, use so much API use that I've spent a dollar. So um, I have, I don't have 4.0, but I've tried it because I um, I do pay for this so I could ac get access to 4.0 and it is substantially better. By all reports, it's um, the difference is extremely significant. I would not be surprised if some of the limitations and drawbacks I, I described mostly went away with 4.0. Um, that is like, okay, we're probably at a stage where regexes will work maybe 5% of the time if you try them. Uh, but with 4.0, 4 it could work like 80% of the time. Now, is that good enough? Like, eh, probably not. But uh, it, it's a, I wouldn't be surprised if you got results like that. And, you know, in a year's time, in two years' time, uh, no one knows how, how much this is going to play out before us progress stalls. But there are a lot of uh, interesting research. I don't think, research-wise, I don't think things have slowed down. Uh, you're still seeing a lot of advances. You're still seeing a lot of models coming out, and that will come out. That will be, uh, you know, each one, one upping the other one in terms of quality. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how this all plays out. But like, so I think that message here is that like, we're at the beginning here. Uh, this is why I think this talk is important. And I think this is why we should be paying attention to this stuff. So let's talk about the uh, existing packages. Um, and because there's a lot out there, people have, uh, I think that people have been integrating with these LMs uh, that often have a relatively easy to use API. So it's kind of natural that people have already put out a lot of packages and coming at this problem from a lot of different angles. I, I don't have time to go through all of these packages. These are great packages though. I, If you're not familiar with them, please check them out. And they all are doing slightly different things. Um, you know, some of these are relatively straightforward um, interactions, uh, you know, just a way to sort of like, you know, almost in a comment sort of way to, um, 
to kind of like have just an interaction, long running interaction with an LM where you kind of, uh, you know, build off previous responses, kind of like the OpenAI's uh, a, a UI, uh, two very more Emacsy things where you can sort of uh, embed these LLM res uh, res responses within a uh, org mode block using the org mode's context, or GitHub Copilot uh, integration where you can use it for auto completion and a very powerful, you know, this, the stuff is, is, is uh, very useful. If it could figure out like what you're trying to do based on the context, it's quite effective. Um, but I want to kind of call out if one in one thing that I'd like to see change, um, which is that users right now, not all of these have a choice of, um, first of all, there's a lot of them. And each one of them is doing their own calls and each one of them is so each one of them has their own inter interfaces they're rewriting the interface to open ai or wherever and they're not they don't most of these do not <coughs> are not do not make it conf that configurable or at all configurable what llm you use this is not good it is important that we use we give the user a a way to change the llm they use and that is because like you might not be comfortable sending your requests over to a private corporation where you don't get to see how they use their data, uh, your data really. Uh, that's especially true with things like embeddings where you might be sending over your documents. You're just giving them your documents basically. And you know, that does happen. Like, you know, I don't think really that there's a reason to be uncomfortable with this, but that, you know, people are uncomfortable and that's okay. Um, people might want to use a local machine, a, a local uh, LLM, you know, for maximum privacy. That's something we should allow. People might want to especially use free software. That's something we should definitely allow. This is Emacs. We need to encourage that. But right now, as, as uh, most of these things are written, you can't do it. Uh, and they're spending precious time just doing things themselves. This is why I wrote LLM, which is like, it will just make that connection to the LLM for you and it will connect to, you know, it has plugins. So if, if it, it, you can, the user can configure what plugin it actually goes to. Does it go to OpenAI? Does it go to uh, Google Cloud Vertex? Does it go to Llama on your machine? We're using Olama, uh, which is just a, a way to run uh, Llama locally. Uh, you know, and more things in the future, I hope. Uh, so this is, I'm hoping that we, we use this. It's designed to be sort of maximally usable. You don't need to install anything. It's uh, on new Alpa. So even if you write something that you want to contribute to new Alpa, you can use it because it's on new Alpa. It's part of the Emacs package, uh, Emacs core packages. So, um, but it has no functionality. It's really just there as a library to use by other people, other um, things offering functionality. Okay. Uh, and it's a little bit too uh, difficult to abstract. I want to point this out because I think it's an important point is that the, it's some of these LLMs, for example, have image generation. Some do not. Some of them have very large context windows, even for chat. Like you say like, okay, all these things could do chat. Okay. Yeah. Kind of. Some of these things you could pass a book to like Anthropics API. Most you cannot. So there really are big differences in how these things work. I hope those dif differences diminish in the future. Um, but it's just one of the challenges that I hope uh, we can can work through in the LLM library. So it's it's compatible, but there's there's definitely limits to that compatibility. Um, I want to point out just to finish off, Emacs is the Emacs has real power here that nothing else I think in the industry is offering. First of all, people that use Emacs tend to do a lot of things in Emacs. We have our to-dos in Emacs with org mode. We have mail, we, you know, we might read email and we might and, and respond to email in Emacs. We might have notes in Emacs. Um, this is very powerful using like, there's not other stuff like that. And you could feed this stuff to an LM. You could do interesting things using a combination of all this data. No one else could do this. We need to start thinking about it. Secondly, Emacs can execute commands. This might be a bad idea. This might be how the robots take over, but 
you could have the LMs respond with Emacs commands and run those Emacs commands and tell the LM the response and have it do things as your agent in the editor. I think we need to explore ideas like this. And I think we need to share these ideas and we need to make sure that we're pushing the envelope for Emacs and actually, you know, doing things, sharing ideas, sharing progress, and, and kind of seeing how far we can push this stuff. Um, let's really help Emacs out, uh, be sort of take advantage of this super powerful uh, technique. Thank you for listening.